بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته and peace be upon you all I know the hearts are heavy you know today I mean it's been heavy but it's even heavier now with like everything is happening in Lebanon and just you know all the news we keep getting in with um you know yesterday the execution of Marcellus Williams as well and just so many things one after another we keep getting exposed to so much injustice and so much um horror happening in the world right and so part of this series and this work that we're doing here is to cultivate to continue cultivating stronger hearts and cultivating inner strength despite what we witness in the world right and that's really what the believer what the believer's mindset and heart set is about it's like okay i'm i'm seeing these things how do i take care of my heart i'm witnessing these things how do i take care of my heart you constantly are turning inward and making sure that the heart that allah gave you to perceive the world and to perceive your path and to perceive everything is still sound and is still working the way it is supposed to function so i know last week i said that i'm going to continue with the lower self higher self values but i realized i skipped over a very important component that we have to actually root ourselves in before we even get into cultivating values and that is and it's very aligned with it's very related to values which is sidq you know and sidq is truthfulness it's a core concept in islam it's a core concept in our faith throughout the quran and throughout the sunnah and so i'm going to be going over the importance of rooting ourselves in what i call and define in my home method as sacred authenticity which is a combination of embodying haq truth right and what is and staying away from what is batil falsehood and sidq truthfulness in the way we carry ourselves in the way that we um in in just that prior, the way we prioritize truth and the way we live truthfully in our lives right so truth plays such a crucial role in the path to aligning ourselves and i i've mentioned this before in my work um as a therapist part of healing and part of the work of growing has everything to do with rooting yourself in truth and aligning yourself with truth and disconnecting from what is false from what is batil from what is basically something you cannot hold on to and that's the thing about falsehood is that it can't sustain you falsehood can't help you especially in times of of struggle it's especially in times of difficulty and so the reason a lot of people are struggling right now when they are witnessing everything in the world is because you can't hold on to falsehood when you're witnessing such things you can't process horrific things like this if you while you're holding on to falsehood while you're disconnected from truth from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us about this world about this path about the akhirah about everything you can't you can't process this human experience while being disconnected from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so even in my you know uh in my work i find that over the last year and re- it's been going on for recent years but i feel like people are starting to wake up to this feeling that truth is being watered down you know and i think a lot of people are waking up to it this year i think after october 7th there's this experience that we're all having where we're witnessing truth come to the surface right and things you know it can't hide anymore <laughs> you know they could they could um no matter how much they tried to alter the message that they were sending and or to spread false messages about what's happening in Gaza the truth is coming out right people are being exposed to truth in such a in such a drastic way and we saw how many people convert to Islam this year because of what's happening in Gaza but i think people are also experiencing the struggle that comes when you try to water down truth that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us water down islam <laughs> faith to water down you, the, your own truths in life and i think that over the last few years in our effort to as a muslim community i see a lot of this an effort to at times look appealing or be accommodating we've compromised on values we've compromised on things that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us is the truth 
And, you know, we're taught in the Quran not to hide what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us. <laughs> but you see this watering down of our faith happening all the time. We're, no, no, we're afraid to say this is a sin. We're afraid to say this is haram. We're afraid to say this is actually what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us because we're afraid of what? People not liking us. We're afraid of not looking cool enough. But there's a consequence to that. When you water down truth, guess what? Those who are seeking it can't find it. And when you water down truth, those who need it uh, struggle because they can't have it. And you yourself struggle. Whenever you water down your own faith, whenever you water down any truth that is that it, you are, you know, you know that you're connected to, whenever you water it down to accommodate the world you are living in or to accommodate people, technically peop this is a form of people pleasing, right? We always talk about people pleasing when it comes to relationships. We don't talk about people pleasing when it comes to you relinquishing the truths that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught you to please the people. <laughs> so people pleasing isn't just in relationship. It, you can do it even when it comes to your spiritual uh, experience and your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But there's a price to that when you're constantly trying to make everything okay. Because you're not the creator. You're not the one who created you. You're not the one who created the heavens and the earth. You're not the one who created your path. You're not the one who created the akhirah. You're not the one who created these truths. You're not the one who created anything. So you are the creation. Who are we to alter Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's truth? So one of the, if any of you are, um, are reading my book, The Compass Home, you'll see that before I even get to practice, I, I have to connect you guys to foundations and theory. There's part one theory, part two practice. And one of the core foundations and one of the core, um, you know, core pieces of knowledge that you have to be so deeply connected to before you even start practicing psycho-spiritual tools that empower you is rooting yourself in truth, in sitk in sacred authenticity. And there are 10 core principles that I share that I feel we are disconnected from in our world. But first I wanna just talk about why it's important to connect to truth. And first of all, you know, when you are not, when you are not connected to not only your truth, but Allah's truth, you're always conflicted, okay? First of all, you're going against your soul because your soul innately ha is knows these truths. That's why when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, in the Quran, when he talks to a person who is sinning, what does he say? Oh, those who have transgressed against their own souls. And then he says, do not despair of the mercy of, of the mercy of Allah. Right. So how is sinning a transgression against your own soul? Because your soul came into this world knowing these truths, knowing, having that sith, having that truthfulness. And every time you go against what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught you, you're going against your own soul, its own fitrah, you know, that innate truth that it was born with. And so there's always conflict. You know, I cannot begin to tell you how many times I've worked with someone who feel conflicted inside and they can't figure it out until they realize they're doing something that they knew all along was displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they only felt peace until they relinquished, when they relinquished that thing, when they let go of that thing. Why? Because the soul knows. You know how we say the body keeps the score in the world of trauma? What we don't often say is the soul keeps the score. It's not just your physical body that keeps the score. Your spiritual body keeps the score too. Your spiritual body can recognize when it has been transgressed. Because you know, when, you, when someone goes through trauma, the physical body at times gets transgressed, right? Like it, it's not, you're, you're, you have to be in survival mode. You have to, when someone, let's say someone goes through abuse, physical, verbal, any kind of transgression against the self, the body feels the effect of that, right? That's why we have to help a person regulate their nervous system in healing work. Why? Because the body keeps the score. It's not as simple as, oh, the trauma ended, now we're okay. No, the body keeps the score. The body experiences the effect of what it is exposed to, good and bad. And not just in terms of like external experiences or trauma, even let's look at nutrition, for example, right? You eat well, your body keeps the score. You don't eat well, your body keeps the score. I cannot begin to tell you how many physical issues people experience are due to nutrition. And there's even a connection between nutrition and psychological well-being. Everything is connected. We can't separate areas of our lives and look at something just on its own because everything is connected. 
So our emotional and mental experience, experiences affect our physical body, our physical health experience. But it also affects our spiritual experience as well. But it's the same thing when, you know, your physical body has nutrition, right? Specific nutrition it needs. That's truth. That's huck, right? That's something nobody can argue with. If you came to someone and you said, oh, feed your body sand, you're going to be like, what are, you, what are you talking about? That's not what the body is designed to even absorb. It's not even designed to absorb that. So you giving it sand is what? Causing it harm. But when it comes to our soul, we think we get to decide what nutrition it needs. We get to decide that. Isn't it interesting? Did you decide your body needs food and water? You never decided that. Who decided that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But yet when it comes to your soul, you think you have the power to decide what your soul needs. No, no, no. I know better. I know better. I don't need this. I don't need that. I don't need Quran. I don't need dhikr. I don't need to remember Allah. I don't need all of that. This is what I need. So you become the Lord of yourself. You become the authority of yourself. And then you wonder why you struggle. So the soul keeps the score too. You don't just have, and I mentioned this in, in my home method, is that our body is not just physical. We don't just have a physical body. We have a spiritual body. And every body has its own nutrition, has its own truths that it needs to be aligned with, that you cannot alter, by the way. Just as you can't alter the way your digestive system works, the way your neurons work, <laughs> the way your brain processes things, that's something that was already created. You cannot alter the truth of your soul and what it needs to thrive in this world. And if you try to do so, you will experience conflict. And so don't try to water down truth. <laughs> don't try to water down what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us, even if you're uncomfortable with it. If you, experience, if you witness something or you read something that you doubt, leave it alone or go ask questions about it. But don't try to claim something if you're not you're sure of it. <laughs> just because your own nafs is uncomfortable with something. This is what's happening in our world. We think that our nafs and its comfort should override what is truthful, what is actual truth. And this is creating a lot of chaos. Why am I saying this? Because again, back to what I said in the beginning, our disconnect from truth is making it really hard for us to navigate our own life experiences in this world but also to navigate what is happening in, in the world around us. The reason Palestinians are so strong is because they don't alter the truth. <laughs> they don't alter the truth that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught them. They don't alter the truth that there's an akhirah, there's a hereafter, there's a world that is higher, that is uliya, that is far greater than this world that is dunya, right? That is lower. And so they don't alter the truth. That's why their ability to, to stand up to the truth and really have that be their foundation and be the guide of what comes out of their mouth and how they act and how they stand firm and how they stay strong, you know, that's why they have that ability <laughs> because they are rooted in truth and they do not alter the truth. But we try to alter the truth a lot, especially in the West, <laughs> to accommodate our own comforts. And God forbid somebody tells us, you know, oh no, that's not what Allah said. No, 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 I can find something that tells you me otherwise. <laughs> That's what people do nowadays. They, if they, something they find, I'm going to try to figure out a way, a loophole, <laughs> to prove that this isn't what Allah meant. <laughs> so, but again, I'm not talking about aligning with truth, not just with Allah's truths. I'm talking about you figuring out what your truths are as well. And this is why I said we have to talk about this before we talk about values. Because many people are disconnected from their values because they don't actually value truthfulness. They don't value sidq. They're so disconnected from sidq, from this embodying truthfulness in their life. And where essentially you're disconnected from who you are, the I, when no one is around. <laughs> who you are when only it is only you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So... The way that I uh, define sacred authenticity in the home method is the practice of prioritizing what is true and real, haq, and what is false, but, and not what is false, batil. So again, the practice of prioritizing what is true and real, which is haq, and not what is false, which is batil, embodying honesty and truthfulness, sitq, in the way we live our life in front of Allah and ourselves, and aligning the inward with the outward, so that our heart and being is not in conflict. 
the more that you practice being truthful and really getting to know who you are in front of Allah, the less conflicting you will, the less conflict will be within you. Meaning what? The world, the person you present outwardly is the same person you present inwardly. So the more that you bridge the gap between who you present to the world and who you present to Allah, who he knows you are inside, the less conflict you will feel inside, the more at peace you will experience inside. And people talk about this in our world today, right? Be authentic. <laughs> be authentic. Authenticity is such a popular world. And we see so many people claim to be authentic, but in, in fact, they're, they can't, they are not, <laughs> because they're not, they're doing things that aren't actually true to their core identity, to their ruh. As I always say, your core identity, who you are, your most permanent self, is your ruh, your spiritual body. It's not this physical body. Meaning that your ruh, your soul, is the part of you that transcends this temporary experience. It's the part of you that always was, that was before you entered a physical body. And it's the part of you that continues on to the higher world after this physical body ceases to exist. So it's, mo it's your most permanent identity. So we are spiritual beings having a human experience. We are not human beings having a spiritual experience. Who you are, your being is, always was spiritual. <laughs> this humanness is an experience. It's, it's something you're journeying through. It's not going to always last. This human body, this human world, this human experience, it's an experience, something you travel through. That's why the believer is like a traveler. It understands that it's going, he, the believer understands that they're going through an experience. It's not permanent. It's not who they are. That's why I always say that the more you make this human experience your permanent reality, the more you will suffer because now you perceive it as your permanent destination rather than an experience, something you're going through. When you look at something as something temporary, your ability to cope with it is so much better, so much stronger. Think about when you experience struggles on a vaca on vacation. You know, you're like, okay, let's. You put it where you put everything in its place because you know it's temporary, and you want to maximize your vacation. You get into an argument with someone. Okay, can we just like table this? Can we just enjoy our time? And when we get back, we can talk about this. Or you know, you try to maximize the time you are there. Why? Because you know it is temporary. So therefore, your ability to maximize that vacation has everything to do with your connection to the fact that it is temporary. So you're able to walk lighter. You don't pack everything because you know you're only there for a little bit of time. Even when you're shopping there, you don't take everything because you know you can't carry it all. So this is why the, most, the strongest people to walk this world are people who are so deeply connected to the temporary reality of this life and the permanent reality of the world that their soul came from and the world that their soul returns to. So we need this constant connection to these truths. We need it. And you need to tell yourself this. I need truth. I need to be connected to truth. Truth should be my priority. And I find that the people who really, subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides, they have this prioritization of truth. They have this heart that seeks truth, that understands that truth doesn't come in two forms. <laughs> They're like, I wanted to find the truth. I used to interview people who reverted to Islam and I used to ask them and one thing, you know, about how they got, how they, uh, you know, became Muslim. And one of the things that I found they had in common was that they were seeking the truth. <laughs> it's like this innate understanding that there can't be several forms of the truth. <laughs> so in our world today, Authenticity is popular. It's a popular world. It's trendy. Everyone's like, I'm authentic. I'm authentic. I'm being my authentic self. And while in many, we see many people claiming this while they're doing things that aren't actually true to their core identity. So many people are, for example, are engaging in behaviors that actually take them out of their most truthful state, their fitra. How can you be authentic if you're engaging in things that disconnect you from your most truthful state, your fitra? The state Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed you to enter this world with and the state in which we want to return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon. So, or, you know, they're viewing themselves in a way that is not in line with the truth of how Allah created them. 
So disregarding Allah's design, disregarding Allah, you know, it's like the same thing I gave with the, uh, the example I gave with the physical body nourishment, right? It's like you saying, oh no, my body needs to eat sand. <laughs> no, you're going against how Allah designed your body. And we don't do this, by the way, with physical things. Like you don't go try to use a copy machine like you use a printer, right? You don't try to use a iPhone like you use an Android, right? We understand this, subhanAllah. We treat objects better than we treat ourselves. We don't claim to be the we don't claim to know what is best for, for an iPhone, what is best for a Toyota. You know, we don't treat a Tesla like a Toyota, right? You don't treat anything in um you don't treat anything in a way that is not aligned with its manual or the way that it was designed. So, and you go to the manual, the people who designed it to let you know how to function, how to, how to utilize it. But when it comes to ourselves, we don't need a manual. No, I have my own brain, which is, which you didn't even create. <laughs> so there is an, an arrogance. That's why when we talk about, you know, people, when we talk about the first sin and shaitan not bowing down to Adam, Alayhi salam and disobeying Allah, it's arrogance. It's you thinking that you you know better. <laughs> when we look at the one of the, when we look at the one of the worst people to walk this earth, Pharaoh, what was it? It was arrogance. What would he say? Anna Rabbukum al ala. You know, saying, I am your Lord most high. He, it's it's see, that's the highest form <laughs> of arrogance. I, I call Pharaoh the the first narcissistic personality disorder case in history and then there's like different forms of it right but it really is rooted in that superiority I know better superiority and we think oh I can never be like that I can never have that trait well you can when you disregard truths that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught you thinking you know better what you know what is best for your life so Allah commands you to do something and you say no 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 th that's not for this time <laughs> that's not what I need right now no no I'm, this is how I want to live my life. <laughs> that's that's you thinking you know better. So it's like it's like an it's like I don't know I, I don't explain. It's like someone trying to use a copy machine and saying I know better, and they're trying to use it in a way that is not aligned with their purpose. Right? Everyone around them is be like, just go to the manual. <laughs> Stop being so. You know those people who like, oh no, I know, I know, I know how to fix something, but then they're doing it in a way that is so against the actual like design of the machine or the design of or the way they're supposed to do something and the people around them will think like why don't they just ask for help why don't they just go to the manual and it's an arrogance it's like i want to prove that i know better <laughs> it's a resistance to submit to truth <laughs> so we have to be careful of the ways that we do this um in our in our own life where we disregard what Allah taught us and we think our way is better or we think we know better or we try to alter the truth somehow. And so this is why it's essential for us to discuss the importance of sacred authenticity um, and why I have, you know, this before I even discuss the psycho-spiritual system and, the, you know, our inner tools like the heart, the brain, why I have this section before I go into that in my book because you can't understand your design before really connecting yourself to truth and understanding the principles of truth and why it's important to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the realities that he taught us about. So I want to go over, and the other thing is I, I want to say is that, you know, throughout the Quran, not only is truth emphasized, but we are warned against one particular practice or trait the Allah, and and where we are warned not to embody it, and that's the opposite of truthfulness. Can anyone think of what that is? What's the opposite of authenticity? I think someone said it. Someone say it? Oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe it came from this side. It's hypocrisy. You know, hypocrisy is the exact opposite of authenticity. So you know, authenticity is aligning what you claim to believe with what you actually do right and what you actually how you actually present yourself so your claims and what you do is is uh, aligned there's no conflict hypocrisy is actually the the very definition of hypocrisy is you claiming something that is not consistent with what you actually do think of like when someone calls another person a hypocrite 
It's like when they claim something, but then they did the opposite. So you're like, why are you being hypocritical, All right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us against hypocrisy throughout the Quran. And he gives us these examples of people who were hypocrites at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warn us against hypocrisy? Why is it something that it's brought up in the Quran? Because hypocrisy is something that, well, first of all, Allah wants us to be truthful and aligned. He does not want us to live as two beings, which a lot of people do. They live as two beings, you know, who they present to the world and who they present in front of Allah. And that's why many people don't feel at peace and aligned because the eye they present to the world is not the same eye they present in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when it's just them and Allah. And it's not the same eye they really live day in and day out. So whenever we assess like a person's values, it's not about, oh, what, what values do you claim? No, no, no. Tell me today what you did, <laughs> what you actually did, because that will show me what you value. Because <laughs> what you value usually is something you do often. What you don't value is something you don't usually do often. So this is, you know, when you, when, when we say like for when we when someone presents a different face to the world that they present in other places or in themselves we call that two-faced right and that's a quality of hypocrites is that the face they present to some is different than the face they present to others maybe their inner circle or to themselves and in in hypocrisy when someone says it it often is used to describe like a lack of integrity it's not a it's not a good word nobody wants to be called a hypocrite but it, it usually embodies these qualities of lack of integrity, uh, being two-faced, not being consistent. And so people lose trust in that, right? And so when you're being two-faced, you're presenting a truth that does not reflect the truth of your heart. You know what the Prophet ﷺ said about this quality of being two-faced? He said, the worst people in the sight of Allah on the day of judgment will be the double-faced people, the two-faced people who appear to some people with one face and to other people with another face. So throughout the Quran and throughout the Sunnah, we're, we're always taught to be truthful. But we're also being warned against being two beings, having two faces, embodying that quality of hypocrisy, where you're in conflict. And who suffers? You suffer the most. Because you're not at peace, you're in conflict. So Islam teaches us that any dishonesty, Islam teaches us that dishonesty of any form, especially taking the form of being two-faced, is a great sin and a sign of ill faith. And coincidentally, in the Western self-help world, inauthenticity is often referred to as bad faith. <laughs> so it's interesting that... Um, I saw this in a lot of the self-help content in the Western, uh, in, the, in the West over the years, where inauthenticity was often described as a sign of bad faith. And in Islam, that's literally what, what it is. It's a sign of ill faith. And so we often think of being two-faced in terms of only deceiving others, but hypocrisy or inauthenticity, because it's the opposite of authentic authenticity, it is not only a form of deceiving others, but above all, it's a form of deceiving ourselves. When you are not aligned, when the truth you present outwardly is not the same as the truth you present inwardly, you deceive no one but yourself. You can't deceive Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah, you might deceive people, but essentially, at the, at the core, you can't deceive Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you only are deceiving yourselves because eventually people will pick up on that. People pick up on consistencies, inconsistencies. People pick up when people are consistently presenting a truth outwardly that is not their truth inwardly, right? And so the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he talks about the hypocrites in the Quran, he says, fain would they deceive Allah and those who believe but they only deceive themselves and realize it not. Now, when we read these verses, we just think of the time of the Prophet ﷺ and the people who deceived the Prophet, who were being hypocrites around the time of the Prophet ﷺ. But we don't, we don't think of it as 
a, a, a timeless lesson that can even apply to ourselves, all the ways that we deceive ourselves. We think of it just in terms of faith and spirituality. You know, we think like, oh, like I'm, because in the Quran, it's when hypocrisy is mentioned, it's talking about the people who claim they believe in Allah, but then when they are by themselves, they are joking about the faith and they're, they're making a mockery of it. So they're, they're hypocritical in that sense, where what they're claiming, the faith that they're showing outwardly is not the faith that they're showing inwardly. But this verse can apply to anything. Any truth that you claim outwardly that you don't really embody inwardly. All the ways in which you deceive yourself. And this is why it's so important when you're reading the Quran, you don't read it like, oh, Allah is just speaking to the people of that time. Allah is speaking to my heart. I'm so sorry about these notifications. I put my phone on airplane mode. I've stopped notifications on the, the watch and I don't know what else to do. So I'm not sure why it's still... Um, sending notifications. I have to figure it out. But um, but yeah, so when we read the Quran, we have to always be assessing, how does this verse speak to me? You know, when Allah says they only deceive themselves, what are the ways in which I'm deceiving myself? Am I really embodying sitq? Am I embodying truthfulness in, in the way that I carry myself in the world? So, so again, in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referring to the hypocrites at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa who would claim to have faith in front of the Muslims, but then they reflect the different truth when they are by themselves. But this is a great, and this is a great and very severe level of hypocrisy, the kind that is intentional and ill-meaning. But many people, of course, don't intend to be hypocrites, and their form of self-deception is not ill-meaning, but rather speaks to like a great gap in our own self-awareness and knowing ourself and our disconnect from truth, that we're not prioritizing truthfulness. So regardless, you know, this verse mentioned still speaks to the fact that we can, in, when we engage, you know, in, in authenticity or hypocrisy in any form, it is a form of self-deception. And remember, we cannot deceive God. We only deceive ourselves when we're not being truthful and living authentically. So again, who we are in front of Allah is who we should always be assessing. And I want you to pay attention to this throughout the next week. You know, again, re-emphasizing that concept of practice, you know, like not just listening to something, but really assessing now the week after, okay, who am I in front of Allah? Do, am I consistent? The things that I'm claiming to value, do I actually do them when it's just me? You know, I, um, are they really things that are, I care about? The beauty of this work is that not only are we going to bridge that gap between the I we present outwardly and the I that we present inwardly, but we become more protected from meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, thinking we have so many good deeds only to find ourselves truly poor. And this is something we should all fear, right? Because, and this is a you know, problem of our time where people become so confident in their own sincerity. You know, I'm so sincere, I'm so authentic, I'm so, you know, whereas the, the most righteous people that came before us, they were always not, not excessive, excessive self-doubt, but not also excessive self-certainty, where they were always engaged in muhasaba and assessing their intentions and their sincerity, and then always asking Allah to accept their deeds. Because when you, after you do any good deed, when you stop and you say, Ya Allah, please accept it, you, you're reminded that only Allah, Allah knows you better than you know yourself. Right? And you ask Allah to forgive you for any kind of insincerity or any sin or anything um, that he sees is wrong in what you, what you have done. So I want to start the, these 10 core principles of truth, and I know we're not going to finish them today, but um, but inshallah we'll continue, maybe spend the next uh, few lessons on this topic. So for us to understand what it means to be authentic and truthful in the most sacred way, we must first deeply understand truth itself through the lens of our creator. To help you do that, you know, I'll share these 10 key principles that are rooted in teachings in the Quran. And again, for those who came in, you can learn more about this in my book, The Compass Home. It gives you a more um, thorough understanding of why we need authenticity. But the first principle is Allah himself is truth. This is the first principle of truth. That Allah himself is truth as he named himself Al-Haqq. This is reflected in, in 
several verses in the Quran, but just to give you two of them, um, in Surah Taha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, so high above all is Allah, the sovereign, the truth, al-haqq. And then another ayah, know that Allah is the ultimate truth. So throughout the Quran, you will see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaching you and reminding you that he is the truth. That's one of his names, right? It's one of his attributes is he is the truthful. He is the truth himself. And this is why I always say like, you know, when we claim to be authentic, it's not enough that we just, that we know our truth. As Muslims, that's why I don't just call it authenticity in my method. I call it sacred authenticity because there's authenticity and then there's sacred authenticity. Authenticity on your own is you knowing your truth and you living by your truths, right? Like, okay, this is true to me and that's enough, okay? This is my truth. That pe Like people say, this is my truth. This is my truth. Yeah, you can be authentic on that level, but you want a more elevated level of authenticity. You want a more elevated level, a sacred level, a level that is higher. It is, you have to assess, is my truth aligned with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's truth? You know, so for example... Your truth is maybe you like engaging in, in a certain habit, right? Or a certain action, or you like doing something in life, right? So that's your truth. That's my truth. This is what I like to do. Now, practicing sacred authenticity is, is this aligned with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is this something that Allah would be pleased with? <laughs> is this something that he has said, first of all, is haram? Should I be avoiding it? So when we say, oh, I'm just being authentic as Muslims, it doesn't, th no, no, no. <laughs> You already testified, la ilaha illallah, that there's no God but Allah that we worship. So you stopping your authenticity at yourself is like you worshiping yourself. You're not the destination. You have a creator. You have someone, you have one you worship. So it's not enough that you're authentic with yourself. You have to always elevate. And that's really the beauty of Islam. Everything you see people doing, like embodying attributes or practices of Islam in our world today, but they'll never they'll never be able to access the elevated level that you can when you practice it with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being the one you worship. I'll give you an example, intentions, right? Over the last decade, so many self-help books, so many things about being intentional. Like this is the thing about navigating Islamic psychology over the last 15 plus years is that you, you, I, you see these things becoming trendy. So when I first started, right, you see these things, you, you, don't, you didn't really see a lot of it coming out about like, um, you know how popular it was to be like living authentically and living intentionally and living purposefully but then as the years went on the research increased people started researching purposefulness people started researching uh you know setting intentions it just became more obviously it might have been there at the time but it wasn't enough that i i noticed it to be trendy at the time right and then it became trendy you know be in being intentional so many books came out about that being authentic so many things came out about that right but they're still limited. You know, when you see people saying, my life transformed. I mean, Oprah, right, was, there was a whole phase where she was talking about being intentional and people were like talking about how their life transformed when they started being intentional. But yet they're still limited. They're still limited because they're, they're still worshiping themselves. <laughs> they stop at themselves and we are limited. So you're, the value you get from the practice that you're doing without Allah becomes limited. But when you do it for the sake of Allah, the value that you get is limitless. Think about an intention, right? Let's say a person is being intentional, but they don't, they don't do it for the sake of Allah. So you set a good intention. Okay, I'm, I know my intention. I'm doing this thing for this intention. I'm being purposeful. I'm connected to my intention. Okay, they're going to go in. They're going to be more present. That's true. They're going to be more present with what they're doing because they're intentional. They're going to derive benefit from being intentional, but they're benefit is still going to be limited. Now let's see someone who does it for the sake of Allah. You set an intention for Allah, which means what? You're looking for value with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-Hayyul Qayyum, the ever-living, the one who never dies, the self-sustaining, self-sufficient, right? The one who is, I mean, all-sustaining. He sustains everything. Now, when you set a value, when you set an intention for the sake of Allah, Allah, like the action is going to end, <laughs> but what Allah gives you will be continuous. So the value you get from that ac action transcends time and place, number one. You will bear, re get rewarded for that action, not only in this world, but in the next. 
So when you set intentions for the sake of Allah, the value of that action transcends the time and place you actually do that action. So it doesn't just stop once you complete the action. You find yourself getting more out of it. You walk away with a heart that is nourished in a way that you can't even describe because you set an intention for the sake of Allah. You find that Allah honors that intention even if it didn't bear fruits at that time. You find that subhanAllah, maybe a week from now, a month from now, a year from now, or even years from now, you see barakah in your life because of that intention. Barakah is something, divine blessing is something nobody can give you except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So whenever we practice something as Muslims, for the sake of Allah, you elevate yourself and you extend the limits of what you receive from what you're doing. Because people ask this, like, what's the, oh, look, you know, people are practicing, you know, these things and what's the difference? <laughs> No, the, the huge difference. <laughs> People practicing it while they're worshipping themselves or worshipping the universe, which is a creation of Allah, and people doing things while worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seeking value with the Lord of the heavens and the earth, Rabbil Alameen, Lord of all the worlds. You know, the universe can't give you anything in return. You can't give yourself actually anything in return. So when we do things and we do it for the sake of Allah, you're, you're going to be compensated by the one who can actually compensate you <laughs> in the most powerful and most beautiful of ways. And that's really the power of intentions, is that you're looking for compensation with Allah above anything else. And what you receive, and you do surely get compensated in a way that cannot be comparable to anything else. So back to the point, the first principle of the 10 principles of truthfulness is God himself is truth, is the truth. That is his name. That is who he has, what he has taught us about himself. And that is what he continuously connects us to throughout the Quran. So you know that what you are receiving is from someone who he himself is the truth, but also so you assess, are you aligned with the truth himself? <laughs> Are you aligned with Al-Haq? Because if you aren't, your um, connection to batil, to falsehood, increases drastically. So remember when I was talking about the Qur'an a couple of uh, weeks ago, and I was saying that when you have a consistent connection with the Qur'an, Allah's words, His truth, His words override your words, the negative thoughts, the negative narratives that you have that, you know, in, internally about yourself, about the world, when Allah's words become your priority, they override your words, people's world, words, society's words. So same thing, when you prioritize Al-Haq himself, that connection to truth, that, that truth itself that you're so deeply connected to starts to override what is false, starts to Purify your heart in a way so your ability to detect falsehood becomes sharpened. You can see truth as truth and falsehood as falsehood. And this is the dua that um, Omar ibn al-Khattab who taught us. Oh Allah, allow me to see truth as truth and guide me to follow it. And allow me to see falsehood as falsehood and guide me to avoid it. So the ability to see truth as truth is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it has everything to do with your connection to truth. But if you're walking around trying to water down truth, truth in yourself and truth that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught you, you will start to see falsehood as truth. And this is what's happening in our time. People literally looking at something false and saying it's true. <laughs> Whereas the heart of a believer can see sees truth as truth, even if it's not popular, even if it's followed by a few, and sees falsehood as falsehood, even if it's popular and followed by the entire world. And that's the heart that we want. So we ask Allah to help us see truth as truth and give us hearts that see truth as truth and guide us to follow truth and allow us to see falsehood as falsehood and guide us to avoid falsehood as well and to to not follow it i will stop here and take questions so pause here and we'll continue the principles uh, next week inshallah yes um, hi i don't need to get too philosophical but i just wanted to ask you about 
Mm -hmm. and like, you know, obviously one strikes to align to like God's truth and, and the divine truth of what's mm -hmm. allowed versus what isn't. But then I, I just wonder about, like, I guess, being a Muslim now and being aged, there's a lot of things that maybe just we get pulled into that might not be aligned with that. And so my mind goes to like, there perhaps there's some dissonance that we would experience in like our most true and authentic selves versus that truth that God wants us to be. And, and so how might one think about that dissonance and, and can solve for that? that yeah, you start assessing like the areas in your life that you're compromising, like the things you're trying to compromise that you know Allah has taught you to fit in or to accommodate because that's why muhasaba, account, self-accountability is so important because if you don't take the time and, and really why a connection to self is so important, knowing yourself is so important. You know, we have the saying in our tradition, man arafa nafsahu arafa rabbahu, whoever knows himself knows his Lord. And the reason there's a connection between knowing yourself and knowing your Lord is in those moments where you're connected with yourself and you realize, wait a minute, why did I just like, you know, say something that I know is haram or I know is displeasing to Allah to just please these people? What, what am I doing here? But if you don't pause in those moments and you just carry on without any muhasaba, those moments will increase. And then you're going to be so far like removed from what you're doing and we see this in our world people are just like talking and they're on cruise control they're not even assessing what is true for them or what isn't anymore it's all about feeling good and so that i think actually creates a lot of mental health struggles too because like i said at the beginning of the talk part of healing and part of growing mentally emotionally um has everything to do with rooting yourself in truth and when we help someone actually heal it's a, a lot of it has to do with challenging their distorted thoughts, their their beliefs that are not true. So we do have to have muhasaba and it's being present. If you're not present with yourself, you're more most likely going to miss a lot of moments where you said something that's not aligned. You 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 just said something, you know, we talk about people pleasing all the time in our in our society, but we never talk about it when we're doing it in terms of like trying to please the people and while while uh disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We always talk about it in terms of ourselves. Oh, don't abandon yourself to please the people. That's what's horrible, which I, I agree. You shouldn't abandon, you shouldn't try to people please at the expense of, you know, not doing right by yourself. But how come we don't talk about how even much more horrible it is and how, how much more harmful it is when we engage in people pleasing while disobeying Allah? Forget yourself disobeying the one who created you. Why is that people pleasing normalized when it shouldn't be? I hope that answers your question. Any other questions before we wrap up? Yes. Well, yeah. mm -hmm. Any advice on setting a good routine? Like, if you miss this one day, how do you recover it? Um, mm -hmm. And when you're out, when you don't feel like uh, you're in. Yeah, discipline is, is a really a gift that we can give ourselves. And it's not to say we're not going to be human. It, you know, part, part of everything is balance, right? Because there are going to be days where you have to listen to yourself. And there might be days where you do need rest and you do need to um, take a breather or you, you know, but if it's a consistent habit where every time you don't feel good, you abandon what is good for you, you're actually going to harm yourself in the long run. And I think that's what we have to watch out for is what I worship my feelings, my nafs, comfort, or am I worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and really staying true to what I claim to believe, even when it comes to goals, like we have claims, oh, I want to achieve this, I want to achieve this. Is it really true? Because if it is true, you're going to show up to that consistently. But if that claim is weak and is not really true, you're going to be so inconsistent in showing up for that goal. So it is, life is about balance. And I think that, but if you're having more days where you're not showing up to your beliefs and your values, there's a problem. And it means that you're worshiping your nafs. It means that you're you, you feeling good as a priority over what is true. So that's how you know. But if you're consistently showing up and then you have a day, for example, and, and obviously this doesn't apply to our five prayers, but let's say like, you know, you're sick. And you're used to doing tahajjud and you're used to doing all these things. And, you know, and you, you say, okay, uh, today I'm going to, I'm going to pray my five prayers. 
and that's what I'm going to do for today. I'm not going to get up for Tahajjud because you're not feeling well. You still obeyed Allah that day. You did what Allah has asked you to do, right? And But if you're having more days where you consistently um, relinquish what Allah wants you to do because you're not feeling good, there's there's a big problem. Okay, we will stop here then, inshallah. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.